in every job description, there are a very limited number of events that are overrepresented in tragedy. And of the thousand things that a dispatcher does, of the thousand things that a jail deputy does, the thousand things that a patrol cop does, there's only about a dozen that are overrepresented downstream in our tragedy, our deaths, our injuries, our embarrassments, our indictments. In every job description, let's identify those and let's make every day a training day. That would be the ultimate goal. San Diego 911 emergency. Oh, you need to come right away. There's a man with a gun and it's what loaded. What you what you Receiving emergency signal from people. Four charge, 1141. We've got a white team We need paramedics uh, close right now. All available units will code that way. The theme for season one is called the Tactical TLC Show, training, leadership, and communication. Each guest gets to share their insights in each of these three areas, and each episode is going to be focused on one at a time, as much as possible. Because, honestly, it's hard to talk about any one of these three areas without also touching on one of the others. Training, leadership, and communication are definitely intertwined. Now, my goal is to be the Robin Hood of public safety, taking wisdom from those that have it and giving it to those that need it, you. And kicking off season one is someone who I can remember from the very first time that I saw him teach. I can tell you when and where it was. My guest for this episode is the world-famous Gordon Graham. The first time I met Gordon, I was in DRE, Drug Recognition Expert School. Gordon came in and taught a four-hour block, and I made a decision that day that any time he was teaching, I was going to be there. He's impacted my life in so many positive ways, and quite frankly, like very few other people have been able to. Gordon has dedicated his efforts to providing the highest quality of training services available anywhere in the world. His programs have received international acclaim, and I can tell you personally, they are amazing. Gordon has expanded his operations from just lecture, and yes, I just air quoted for those of you listening to the podcast, to a lot of different other areas, including his commitment to firefighter safety. And as a former firefighter, I can tell you, this one is important to me. You can view the efforts at firefighterclosecalls.com. And these links that I mentioned, these uh, different websites, they'll be in the show notes. And if you're in public safety, please take a look at Lexapol. L-E-X-I-P-O-L dot com. Because this growing company has taken the concepts that Gordon has lectured on for decades and put those thoughts into a framework that can be applied to any public safety organization. Gordon's programs are in use around the world. And while he's received a lot of different accolades and awards, I was really impressed with him receiving the Presidential Award for Excellence. And that was presented to him by the International Association of Fire Chiefs in 2005. He also received the California Post Award for Lifetime Achievement in Law Enforcement. He got that in 2009. In 2015, he received the Lifetime Dedication Award from the International Public Safety Leadership and Ethics Institute. And in 2018, not that long ago, he received the James Oberstar Sentinel for Safety Award for his lifetime work in improving aviation safety internationally. And you thought he was just like a law enforcement trainer or just a firefighter training. He trains in every sector. It's amazing. So whether you're in the public or private sector, Gordon's programs work and work well. And should you need anything further, he says, please do not hesitate to contact him or his fantastic staff anytime. You and I are both very lucky to have Gordon give us his time, his wisdom, his insights. Would you please do me a favor? Hit the subscribe and the like buttons. Take a moment to leave a comment. Please list what takeaways you got from this episode, because that lets Gordon know what is drawing interest from people and that lets him know where he's being helpful. So without any further waiting, here's my hero, my mentor, my friend, Gordon Graham and his take on training topics. I am totally honored today to have Mr. Gordon Graham with us. And this man needs absolutely no introduction. If you have not heard of Gordon Graham, I don't know where you've been on this planet, but he is my hero. He's my mentor. He is just uh, a wealth of wisdom. And as the Robin Hood of public safety 
public safety I can't talk today, where I'm taking wisdom from those who have it and giving it to those who need it. Gordon definitely has boatloads of wisdom. So Gordon, welcome to the show. Mr. Robin Hood, good to see you, sir. Oh, I'm sorry, it's Carrie. <laughs> How are you doing, sir? I'll, I'll answer to a standard response. I'll answer to anything. Don't call me late for dinner. Good. So, uh, so we start off the show talking about training, of, of which I know that's one of your favorite subjects. So tell me what kind of challenges are we seeing in public safety and what kind of solutions are there out there? Well, I guess the, the big question here, and I ask this every time I give a lecture to cops, is after you graduate the academy, you get all probation, if you choose not to promote, when's the next time you got to take a serious test you have to study for? You know, and the answer for most law enforcement agencies is we don't. Yeah. You know, and that, that's troublesome. Um, you know, I don't, I don't want to make light of this, but in many states, uh, the woman who does a woman's hair is required by the state to take a regular test to make sure she's got the necessary knowledge, skills, and abilities to do women's hair. Well, Gordon, that's a good rule. We don't want women's hair getting screwed up. Uh, we've got cops carrying guns with bullets who haven't been tested on the shooting policy since point of hire, uh, driving 170 mile an hour Dodge Hemi chargers, and they haven't been tested on the vehicle ops policy since point of hire. Fourth Amendment issues, uh, Second Amendment issues. You know, there are a limited number of things that continue to get us in trouble, and I fervently believe that in every job description, we need to identify what those events are. And those are the ones where we need to focus the training and not just training. Now having a piece of paper saying that somebody went to a class means nothing to me. And frankly, it means nothing to a jury downstream. It means nothing to our public. You know, how do we really know what they know about this prior to their involvement in the incident? So the training and testing component is absolutely essential. So what, what could, let's say there's a, a a trainer out there that's wanting to make a difference with their agency, what would you suggest that they do to start to impact that problem? Well, I would take a look at the current offerings on training. And, and frankly, for many training officers, their principal responsibility is making sure people go to a class, make sure they get signed in, make sure they get signed in. What did they really learn in that class though? And, you know, and so I guess the first step is identifying what we need to train on. And of course that would include, all of the things that are mandated by state law in the particular states we're dealing with, there are some things that require ongoing training. But I want to have a cradle to end of career training, focusing on what I call the core critical tasks. In every job description, there are a very limited number of events that are overrepresented in tragedy. And of the thousand things that a dispatcher does, of the thousand things that a jail deputy does, the thousand things that a patrol cop does, there's only about a dozen that are overrepresented downstream in our tragedy, our deaths, our injuries, our embarrassments, our indictments. In every job description, let's identify those and let's make every day a training day. That would be the ultimate goal. Where to get started depends on your strength in the agency, depends on how much uh, credibility you have with your bosses, depends on the ability of the bosses to deviate from what they've known for years. Um, so there's a number of things that need to be done. Okay, perfect. And um, just so you know, so I know in California, as an example, that because I'm on the quality assurance panel, so when we do a QAP audit of post courses, one of the things that we absolutely encourage as best practices is to have an exam, a meaningful exam at the end of the course. So would you would you recommend that people that are dealing with their individual state post begin to just incorporate that into their courses and in just on their own and also maybe maybe at the different meetings that they have with their post uh, coordinators or any 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 time that the conferences that involve post maybe bringing this up absolutely absolutely because I guarantee you that downstream in federal court or state court. If you're a defendant, particularly if you're a chief officer or a sheriff. Oh, oh I just, I'm going to stop you because I just do. So you, you, were, you were talking about um, you, go, going back to the testing issue. Yes, I, I guarantee you the downstream in court, whether it's a state or federal, for that matter, even civil or criminal, but I really worry about the, the civil side for these purposes, 
the question is going to be posed to the chief, to the sheriff, to the defendant. When was the last time your employee was trained and tested on the shooting policy? When was the last time they were trained and tested on the pursuit policy? Yeah. And, you know, and if your answer is, well, one time in time, some time ago, and I see this on so many of these events where we talk to the people, well, the last thing they were trained on, it was at point at higher 15 years ago. That's not going to impress anybody. And forget the lawsuit, you know, an officer gets killed or injured because they don't know the use of force policy. If you hesitate, you know, that's problematic. People yeah. are dying because cops don't know the use of force policy, you know. They, they don't understand these things. And it's not because they're bad people. I am firmly convinced that people do not start off their shift in law enforcement with the intent to do bad things. Right. That's very, very rare. Yeah. Most of it gets down to internal error, good people who make mistakes, particularly on that limited number of events that they don't experience every day, what I like to call those core critical tasks. We need to identify them. And from start a career at the academy, through the FTO process, through the uh, initial training, through the ongoing training, through the daily training, the quarterly training, the annual training, whatever, we need to focus on those core critical tasks. And the only level of knowledge that's acceptable is 100%. You know, what's 70% mean to a jury downstream? It's okay to be wrong three times out of 10 on a decision to use deadly force. 80% yeah. is not much better. You know, we need to identify them. You know, Carrie, I, I've, I've say this in class and people laugh at me. I want an annual test. Part of the performance evaluation for every cop, for every dispatcher, for every jail deputy, for every trooper, for everybody, an annual test focusing on these core critical tasks and the only acceptable level of knowledge on the test is 100%. And people look at me, Gordon, you're an idiot. You'll never get that past the union. Well, why don't we have the union help write the test? Yeah. Well, Gordon, if the union writes the test, then the employees will know the answers. Is it okay if they know the answers? You know? No, we're management. We must trick personnel at all costs. Those days are gone. Get together with the union. Build a test. Put the test on your intranet inside your department. Anybody can access that 24-7. The question, the answer, and the analysis of the answer. We've got good people. Good people who end up in big, big problems. Death, injury, indictment, lawsuits, embarrassment. Not because they're bad people, but because they weren't fully and adequately trained. And I'm fed up. Uh, you know, it's it just... I don't want to come across as being Mr. Negative here because the vast majority of things our people do around this great country, they're doing right. But when things don't go right, there are significant consequences. These are not surprises. These are not what we call the black swans. These are gray rhinos. They're identifiable risks. They're manageable risks. We can do something about this. The, and and uh, your, your statement of, I don't want to come across as Mr. Negativity. Look, the only reason that somebody is as passionate as you are about this is because they truly care about it being a positive change. And when you identify something that needs to change and you have a solution for it, then yeah. And you, and clearly you're passionate about it and your, your heart's always been in this. And, and literally uh, I told you before, I can still remember the very first time I ever heard you talk and um, you, you, you've been that way. You've been this passionate about, uh, these 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 topics and this sort of thing since since I first heard you gosh twenty five plus years ago wow so yeah so uh, thank you for law that. enforcement and I hate to beat this phrase to death the thin line you know the blue line the green line the gray line whatever it's the line between right and wrong you know and if we have cops who are not confident in being able to do their job and there's a number of issues why they lack confidence these days. Uh, that's a huge problem line and wait. And the ultimate loser is going to be the great people of this na great nation of ours. And we've got to take this seriously. Well, and it's, it's also the fellow officers yep. that lose. Yep. Yeah. So um, let me ask you this. When, when we talk about the, the, the core things that, are the are the gray rhinos as you so well put it what is what is one thing what would you tackle first from a training perspective and and, and what could you know because I, I told you before we talked before we started this show is that my thing is takeaways mm -hmm. so what what's a takeaway that a a patrol level deputy, a corrections you know a, a corrections officer who's rolling around the cell blocks what would you recommend that they do to improve 
their training uh, in, or their world in the area of training? What would you recommend that they do? Well, what's the primary mission of everybody in public safety? Cops, firefighters, dispatchers, EMS, paramedics, you pick the profession. What's the primary mission? And when I teach line personnel, I ask that question, what is your primary mission? Primary mission of everybody in public safety is preservation of life. Mm -hmm. Preservation of life. So anything that focuses on preservation of life, use of force is clearly a preservation of life issue. Vehicle operations is a preservation of life issue. Uh, barricaded suspects is a preservation of life issue. Police suicides is a preservation of life issue. We've got to preserve life. I, I read a study out of the UK where they, and I'll probably misquote it greatly because I, I read what I wanted to read. But every five years, they asked cops over a 25-year window what their primary mission was. And it changed. When they were brand new, no, we're going to arrest bad people and take them to jail. And when they had 10 years on, the mission changed slightly. By the time they had 20 years on, they figured it all out. The primary mission is preservation of life. You know, now, we can prioritize the preservation. And there, there are people out there who talk about that. It's a very difficult topic to talk about. You know, what's most important? Is it the victim? Is it the witness? Is it the cop? Is it the suspect? We can prioritize preservation of life, but anything dealing with preservation of life needs that constant ongoing training. Yeah. Yeah, ab ab absolutely. And, and having that training be validated is one of, is, is the key thing that you were talking about, having it tested, yep. you know, showing that you really did actually retain it you know one of the things that i've always said gordon is that there for that's that's the, the true test of effective training is is there a change in behavior well part of that behavioral change can be te can be shown through a test and you you have to have four components to training and and that is good content accountability and the accountability is the testing as far as I'm concerned and, and whether or not, you know, of course, did they attend the training? Did they sign in? Were they there the whole time? But part of that accountability is the testing. Repetition and role play is another big one that if, if all they have is lecture only, they're not getting good, effective training. So making sure that you have all four components of effective training is I think every training lieutenants or training coordinators role and what I'm hearing you loud and clear is let's make sure that on the accountability portion of that that we actually have that in place. Yes I, I remember a, a quote from decades ago uh, what I what I read I learn a little bit what I hear I learn a little bit more what I practice I learn the most and I'm a big fan of repetition Repetition, repetition, repetition. I think adults learn much better by repetition than they do immersion. So immersing a person in a class is one issue, but that constant ongoing repetition. And when people wonder why I say the same thing over and over again in my live lectures, you know, predictable is preventable. Predictable is preventable. You know, if they hear that often enough, it'll become something they will remember and they will practice. And I cannot tell you how many times people see me in the mall, hey, predictable is preventable. Predictable is preventable. They remember that, and that makes me feel good. Yeah. Yeah, ab absolutely. And it, it does sink in. I mean, it even sunk into my thick head. And, you know, I still, re I still remember one of the times that I saw you talk. I had uh, worked a graveyard shift the night before, came and sat in your class all day, and was going back to work to work another graveyard shift. Um, I, I, and, and that still sunk in. So your, your uh, methods do work, that's for sure. We'll, we'll carry along that line there. And I know you're going to edit this and figure out how to make this thing work the best. But what the heck are we doing scheduling a graveyard cop right. on training the next day? I, totally. You know, well, you're dog tired. Yeah. It well, and, and, and I agree. And, and I, in, in that particular instance, my supervisor at the time would not give me the time off. Now, there was another time that I came and saw you talk that my supervisor would not give me the time off and I was able to get, you know, I, I used my personal vacation time just to be able to see you. Wow. That was, that was, uh, you were in San Diego at that time. Um, you were presenting for the Sheriff's Department and I crashed their training to be able to see you talk. Wow. But Thank you for that. But oh, you're, you're welcome. Really, but in, really, that, in that case, I was willing to, you know, but it still, it cost me the equivalent of a day's pay to be able to come to that training 
in, in the case, yes, you're absolutely right. Going back to your point of why do we, why do we schedule the graveyard training? Now, in that particular case, that was the only time you were, that you were available. Would have, sure would have been nice if they'd had you at nighttime. Well, it's not the only time I was available because I am the only speaker that I know that teaches on a 24-hour clock. You know, and I've always offered that. If you need the class, you know, the most expensive part about training is not paying me to come in. The most expensive part of training is the butts in the seat. Yeah. So you've got 50 cops there at $500 a day total pay package. There's $25,000 sitting there. And if they're not learning anything, we're throwing that money away. Yep. So I've always said, if you need the class from midnight till 8 a.m., I'll teach from midnight to save you the overtime and to put it inside their cycle of sleep, you know, where they actually are awake because that's the hours they normally work. Yeah. And, you know, and, and again, Carrie, in my little world, I'm nobody, but I figured that out when I was brand new. Why is training an eight to five component when people are working at nights? Why do I disrupt a sleep cycle? Why do I have to pay overtime to make this person go to training? If we schedule all 25 of those deputies for daytime, now it's time and a half. So you've got 75, or excuse me, $37,500. I know I did it quickly. I went to Catholic school. $37,500 of overtime to listen to somebody when I will do it. Well, no, I'm sorry, Gordon. We don't train at nighttime. Yeah. Why? Well, we've never done anything like that before. You know, uh, years ago, years ago, I can remember the CDC, the California Department of Corrections, and they got in trouble for, they had a policy that on any, any disturbance in the, the, the yard, they would shoot to kill. Mm, you know, I remember that. And I, I could be wrong on that, but that was the takeaway I got. Really that. familiar. That's what I got from it too. Yeah, it, it, was, uh, it was sad. So then they, they did it. It ended up being a very, very bad policy. But then we learned what? That the only training they'd ever have on using the rifle was during daylight hours on level ground at paper targets. You know, I'm not a shooter, but I know people who are shooters. There is a whole world of difference between shooting from an elevated post at nighttime than there is shooting from the ground level during daytime. You know, and, yeah. and why are we doing this? Well, Gordon, we've always done it this way. You know, status quo. One of the, the rules I keep on preaching is we've got to look for new and better ways. Our public deserves better than minimum standards. Our people deserve better than minimum standards. Our profession deserves better than minimum standards. We've got to be looking for the next best way. Well, Gordon, we've always done it this way. You know, it just, it's, it's, it's nightmarish to me that we're locked into um, you know, this insane thing that we don't train during the hours we work. Excellent, excellent point. And, and, and a great way to, to finish up the block for the tactical TLC on training. And uh, what I'd like to do next is I'm going to have you shift gears just a little bit and we're going to shift into leadership. Thanks for listening to the Tomorrow's Police Officer podcast. This episode of season one, Tactical TLC, was all about training. Be sure to look for the next two segments of this interview that cover leadership and communication. New episodes come out every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 6 a.m. Pacific, 0600 hours. To listen to the other episodes, simply go to our website, tomorrowspoliceofficer.com forward slash podcast. There you'll find not only a complete library of all of our episodes, you'll also find show notes, links, our guest biographies, as well as contact information for our guests so you can learn more about them and from them. Now, if you or someone you know is interested in a law enforcement career, be sure to check out the Get Hired Academy, where you'll be able to learn everything you need to become a law enforcement officer. We cover everything from preparing for the written exam, take you through all of the interviews and all of the other testing that you'll do during the background investigation process, and get you fully prepared for the final interview to get you hired. I've coached hundreds of people through the hiring process, and I don't want you to say or do something that will end your career before it even begins. Look, we need great cops, and I can help you get hired. Now, whether at work or at home, if you've ever had someone get mad at you, even when you've had the best of intentions, for some reason they didn't trust you, didn't believe you, they were upset with you, or maybe you were the one who had the misunderstanding, there's a lot of help available on our website. The reality is first responders have tons of extra stress in their relationships, both at home and at work. And it seems like every time you turn around, there's a new load being put on your shoulders. You can quickly find what you need at the tomorrowspoliceofficer.com website. Communication skills, new and innovative de-escalation training, leadership and relationships, those are our areas of specialty. 
So check out tomorrowspoliceofficer.com and you'll find what you're looking for. Until next time, stay safe.